Have you seen The Wire? Oh my god, you have to see The Wire. Especially, especially now. Like, it's so relevant. It just really gives you perspective on what's, like, really happening, you know? Chances are you've probably heard this before at some point, and probably from someone who's nerdy and looks like me. Earlier this year, in the wake of the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, a lot of people were suggesting a different diet of media, one that was a lot less white-focused. 13th got a ton of attention on Netflix, bookstores were selling out of ta Coates books, and the TV world was telling everyone to watch The Wire. But the central tension in The Wire is between the police and the drug gangs of Baltimore. So does that just make it another piece of pro-police copaganda? Welcome to my series on copaganda. In this series of videos, we've been looking at the way police have been portrayed on television and how that portrayal has shaped our understanding of what the police are. In episode one, we looked at the origin of the genre, which involved heavy police censorship and control. In episode two, we looked at how Blue Bloods explains away police criticism to its older, whiter audience. And in episode three, we looked at Brooklyn Nine-Nine and the show's faith in incrementalism. And today, we're talking about The Wire. When you walk through the garden, gotta watch your back. Back in episode one, I cited The Wire as a cop show, and I got more than one comment saying, wait, The Wire's a cop show? That comment caught me off guard. I mean, yeah, The Wire's a cop, duh, it's a cop show. There's, it's a cop show. The title, The Wire, literally refers to wiretaps that the police set up to catch drug dealers. A bunch of characters on the show are police officers. I can't even count the number of times somebody has said good police on the show. Be good police. Good police. Good police. Good police. Good police. For those of you who don't know, The Wire is about the war on drugs in Baltimore in the 2000s. It follows the police waging the war, the dealers on the street, the addicts caught in the middle, the political framework that surrounds the whole thing, and so much more. But The Wire is different. It's not like other cop shows. The show skips over most of the gun-toting and chasing that cop shows have historically relied on for dramatic tension. It spends an unusually long amount of time explaining the bureaucracy of wiretaps. I think we got enough PC from the hand-to-hands and surveillance. We got most of the exhaustion. I'm exhausted. Just listen to this Good. Exhaustion is a legal requirement for using electronic intercepts. The Wire isn't even really centered on the police at all. It spends equal time with all of its groups and factions. The police aren't the protagonists of the story. In fact, there really might not be any protagonists on The Wire at all. The show isn't really about any particular character or group of people. It's about the city of Baltimore, its many systems of punishments and incentives, and the society that they create. In the words of creator David Simon, it's, quote, a Greek tragedy done in a modernist, urban way, with the city as the main character. The Wire isn't actually even really a cop show at all, and that's what makes its perspective on the police so important. Heads up, there will be some spoilers in this video, but I also think that The Wire is kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. You don't need the box to solve it, but it definitely helps. All I'm saying is that don't let a spoiler warning slow you down. Please, please keep watching my video. We're building something here, Detective. We're building it from scratch. All the pieces matter. Ever since George Floyd and Breonna Taylor were murdered, there's been a huge call for police reform, specifically when it comes to racial bias, and specifically coming from white people. Activists have been talking about this sort of thing for decades. But there's no denying that we're in a new era of widespread awareness when it comes to issues like mass incarceration, police brutality, and racial profiling. And that's great. But those issues are all just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the systemic problems that create the conditions for racist outcomes in our justice system. In the words of the Center for Policing Equities, Philip Atiba Goff, If a police department beats up black people four times more often than it beats up white people, that's clearly a problem. But our articulations, our conversations about policing have been so narrow, because our understandings around public safety have been so narrow, that we have erased all the upstream factors that end up showing up as outcomes when we're talking about policing. And this is especially important when it comes to race in policing. In the shows that we've looked at so far in this series, there's a tendency to focus almost completely on the police angle of the equation. And that makes a lot of sense from a storytelling perspective. That simplification creates high stakes and a bit of black and white morality that's easy to follow. Cop good, criminal bad, catch criminal, party time USA. On The Wire, things are a bit more complicated. For one, it gives equal time to both sides of the war on drugs. 
On many police procedurals, the police are the only constants. Cases change and criminals come and go, but the show sticks with police officers and detectives, staying firmly rooted in their perspective. On The Wire, we spend time with those detectives like McNulty, Kima, Daniels, and Freeman, but we spend just as much time on the other side of the equation, with Bodie, Poot, D'Angelo, and Stringer. And The Wire doesn't keep things so binary either, where the first season of The Wire focuses intently on the police trying to crack the Barksdale drug gang, every season adds a new institution to the mix. The second season introduces us to the Polish dock workers who smuggle in the drugs. The third season introduces local politics, the fourth brings us the education system, and the fifth adds media and journalism. Every institution is put under the magnifying glass, taking the time to teach the audience how they work, their strengths, their weaknesses, their motivations, and their fears. I've long thought of a season of The Wire in terms of dominoes. The first third or so of the season is all about meticulously setting them up, showing us each individual domino in incredible detail. You get a sense for where things are, but it's hard to see the whole picture until something happens and sets things into motion. The second third of the season watches all of the dominoes tumble into each other, and the last third deals with the aftermath. The Wire never abandons a previous institution to address its new material. It stacks them, showing us how everything is connected and how all the pieces matter. Okay, but why? Why? Why does that structure matter? Why do we need to see all of this extra stuff to understand crime and police? Well, there are a few reasons. First and foremost, this kind of approach allows The Wire to do something a lot of other cop shows don't. Paint parallels between the police and the dealers. Many cop shows depict a world where the police are looking for evildoers, waiting for someone to slip up and reveal their true nature as a criminal, and then catch them before they can do harm to anyone else. We have to get his latest batch off the street before more kids die. What makes The Wire so different and so especially relevant to this conversation about policing and crime is that it's much more focused on nurture over nature. That is, showing us that it is circumstance that dictates why someone might turn to crime. The Baltimore Police Department and the Barksdale Drug Gang are really similar institutions. They have a similar chain of command. Both organizations show the disconnect between the goals of the top brass and the reality the grunts are dealing with on the ground. Each institution is filled with rules and regulations and people within their ranks that want to do things differently. Yeah, but the game ain't gotta be played like that, yo. And there's more subtle symmetry too, like these two shots in the penultimate episode of the first season, showing characters in the gang and the police forced to take a course of action they really wish they didn't have to. The implication here is that, given different circumstances, these characters easily could have been each other. They're living in the same structures, they're just made from different materials. In the words of David Simon's writing partner and former Baltimore detective Ed Burns, quote, In a different era and a different place, these guys probably would have been our robber barons or our Goldman Sachs people. In their world, it's drug dealing. There's no other occupation that you can depend on. This comprehensive approach builds empathy in the audience for characters from all backgrounds. We come to care about Bodie and Stringer just as much as we care about McNulty and Lester, and as much as we care about Omar. I'm just kidding, of course, we all love Omar the most. Oh, indeed. Now, building empathy this way isn't radical. TV and film are some of the best tools we have for putting you in someone else's shoes. They provide a proxy for seeing the world through the eyes of other people, and it's why we talk so much about representation in media. But again, the Wire's different. It's not like other cop shows. It doesn't just get you to care about its characters because it's showing you what their lives are like. It's linking them together with tons of subtext. They might have different systems, but they're all playing the same game. Look man, I do what I can do to help y'all. But the game is out there, and it's either play or get played. Each of these characters is fighting against a system. Whether that's good police pushing back against the corruption in their department, or dealers trying to make a living in a poverty-stricken world. They're all raging against the machine. And that context means everything. By zooming out season after season, The Wire shows us how the circumstances causing crime and corruption and poverty, they're all connected. It's all part of the same system if we can just expand our horizons to see it. It might seem like all these institutions are separated, but they're not, and that's what makes changing any individual ones so difficult. Okay, but this is all super duper general. Let's get more specific and look at season four of The Wire. And if you don't want this season to be spoiled for you, you can jump ahead to part three. Corner boys, huh? Okay, let me ask y'all something. You know, you help us hone in on this, and maybe we do a little better job with you in here. What makes a good corner boy? 
In the show's first three seasons, we're introduced to a number of different kinds of characters on the streets. We have the drug kingpins, Stringer and Avon. We have the stick-up man, Omar Little. We have middle management dealers like Poot and Bodhi. We have the addict, Bubbles. We've come to understand their current motivations. How Bubbles is stuck in a cycle of addiction. How Omar robs dealers in order to make a living. How the Barksdale organization provides some way to survive poverty in West Baltimore. We've come to understand the paths these characters are on and the challenges they face in getting off of them. But was there ever a point where they could have been saved, where someone could have intervened? Look, I'm ready to acknowledge that um, 18 to 21 might be too seasoned. <laughs> in this season, The Wire decides to intervene earlier, in the education system. Enter Michael, Naaman, Randy, and Duke. We meet them in the classroom of Mr. Prez, a former cop turned school teacher just like the character's creator, Ed Burns. I used to be police. Now I'm a teacher. Prez does his best to reach the kids on their terms, teaching probability through the class's love of dice games and dusting off an old computer. Duke shows a knack for the computer. Michael is obviously bright, excelling in math, and Randy shows an entrepreneurial streak, figuring out that he could make money by bulk buying candy. This mean the price I'm getting from the Koreans? Well, they still marking it up some. They gotta be. I can make twice as much using this hit. Naaman is placed in a separate program. We'll circle back to him in a minute. Each character shows great promise, but even Prez's extra attention can't change the society these kids were born into. Oh, man, what the f you want to go to school for? What you want to be? Astronaut? A dentist? A pay lawyer, nigga? Okay, but why not? Why can't Michael become any of those things? Doesn't he have a choice to not join the drug trade? Well, not really. Those are all huge long shots for a kid trying to take care of his younger brother and addicted mother, no matter how well he does on a math test. And okay, maybe you think he should just pull himself up by bootstraps. But here's the thing. That phrase literally means to do the impossible. You can't lift yourself up by pulling on your feet. Try it. In his essay about growing up in Baltimore, titled A Culture of Poverty, ta Coates writes about this criticism of, quote, street mentality and how it betrays a lack of understanding. Quote, the problem is that rarely do such critiques ask why anyone would embrace such values. Moreover, they tend to assume that there's something uniquely black about those values and their embrace. If you are a young person living in an environment where violence is frequent and random, the willingness to meet any hint of violence with yet more violence is a shield. If we overlay a map of public schools with high populations of students in poverty with a map of where the best test scores are, it's hard to not see the correlation. And these are correlations we can see at every level of education. According to the U.S. Department of Education, by the end of the fourth grade, African-American, Hispanic, and low-income students are already two years behind. Fewer than 30% of students in the bottom quarter of income enroll in a four-year university, and less than half of them graduate. Public schools are often funded by property taxes, and along with other factors like mass incarceration breaking up family units, poverty and poor education can create a feedback loop. By focusing on kids, we can see that their position of poverty is clearly independent of any life choices they've made. They don't deserve this lot in life. Throughout the season, The Wire shows us the uphill battle each character faces in trying to find some way to stay afloat. This process gives us empathy not just for who they are now, but the characters we can see them transforming into, characters we've already met as adults. Michael ends up getting tangled in the game, offering to work for the new kingpin Marlowe in exchange for him taking out his abusive father and saving his little brother. Duke is a nice smart kid, but he's even poorer than his friends. He has no running water in his house and he gets evicted, forcing him to move in with Michael. Randy tries to keep his head down, but unwittingly becomes swept up in the game when he is used to deliver a message that leads to a murder. Then he tries to do exactly what society wants a kid in his situation to do. He tries to discreetly tell the authorities, but that very system abandons him to be labeled as a snitch. Randy is unable to survive on the street or to escape it. Naimond is a rare bright spot. He's the son of Weebay, an enforcer from the earlier seasons and the star of this absolutely iconic gif. He is placed in a program with Bunny Colvin, meant to remove problem students from the classroom so other kids can actually learn. In that class, Colvin sees that Naimond and the other students are bright, just pointed in the wrong direction. They don't lack ambition or drive, they just realize that the skills they're learning in school aren't going to help them survive. You know where you're going, and we can't teach you anything you don't know about that, right? 
That's what we've been saying. Even in middle school, as a survival mechanism, the kids of The Wire are already indoctrinated into a system. When asked where they'll be in 10 years, the answers range from dead to the NBA. Yeah, but only for the Lakers, though. But when asked what makes a good corner boy, they light up. What makes a good corner? Keep your eyes open. Keep the count straight. Don't trust nobody. Uh -huh. And again, The Wire expertly lines up how all of this is not a unique problem for the streets of Baltimore, but something that is universal in American society in some shape or form. Don't cheat, don't steal, or whatever. But what about y'all, huh? What, the government? What's the Amron? <laughs> Steroids? Yeah. Liquor business, booze, the real killer out there. Through this program and Colvin's special attention, Naaman comes to realize that he doesn't have to be a part of the game. Go ahead, Nay. Get your pack off this bitch so we could go. I ain't want it. This is a rare happy ending, but so many things have to break right for Naaman to break out. He already had money growing up from his father's work as an enforcer, so he was more financially stable than Randy, Michael, and Duke. He was given an opportunity by Colvin, who gives him unique singular attention and offers to adopt him. He's also really bad at drug dealing. That was never gonna be a real avenue for him. Youngins don't got a scrap of work ethic nowadays, man. If it wasn't for his pops, I wouldn't even bother. This is so much more context to crime than most cop shows give us. These aren't nameless non-white people robbing a liquor store. We're meeting them before the police do, before they've even thought about committing a crime. So what does The Wire do with all the context it gives us? What's the message that the audience gets? Well, that the cycle is really hard to break and not just from the street level. These systemic problems are incredibly resilient. Colvin's partner starts the alternative education program when he sees how many students are being failed by the education system. But that program is dismantled because these would be the children left behind, so to speak. Yeah, but as it is, I mean, we're, we're leaving them all behind anyway. We just don't want to admit it. Tommy Carchetti wins the mayorship, hoping to rise through the ranks to make top-down changes, but the sacrifices he has to make in order to rise means that nothing ever changes. Then there's Sergeant Carver. Where's the law, Bodhi? Where's the mother law? Throughout the series, we've seen Carver evolve as a police officer. In the first season, he sucks. He steals money from busts, and he spies on the major crimes unit for his corrupt superiors. I mean, the dude almost started a riot with his partner, Herc, by trying to drunkenly raid the Barksdale Towers. But by the time season four rolls around, Carver is much more mature. He establishes a relationship with dealers, he works soft power, he tries community policing. In short, he's now good police. Can't bust every head, Tony. I can't. Bust every head, who are you gonna talk to when the happens? So, this is a redemption story, right? A bad cop learns from his mistakes and becomes a hero for society. Well, no. As much as Carver has grown as a police officer, he still fails Randy, unable to protect him while he cooperates with the police or to find him a new foster parent. Even when given one of the best community police officers available, one who gets it, The Wire shows the limitations of even the most optimistic vision of the police. You gonna look out for me, Sergeant Carver? You mean it? You gonna look out for me? What's your point, Jay? My point is, he can't help it. It makes him an asshole, I know, but it's also what makes him good police. Okay, so we're at the moment of truth. Is The Wire copaganda? Drum roll, please. Maybe. I said it with conviction, though, so I think you have to believe me. <laughs> there are people that argue that any media, including the police, upholds a status quo. Professor Stephen Thrasher said as much when asked about The Wire on NPR's 1A podcast. What I think is very dangerous is that the, the central premise of the existence of the show also is predicated on the fact that the police have to exist, that we have to have these institutions. And I said something similar about Brooklyn Nine-Nine in my previous video. But I think it rings a little more hollow in the case of The Wire, and not just because I like The Wire more. The Wire doesn't really make the argument that anything is sacred or worth holding on to. It shows people trying their best to survive in a way that builds empathy between us and them, and then shows us how their best stands no chance against the machinery of the system. 
Still, it definitely sends some pretty pro-police messaging. The Baltimore Police Department is severely underfunded in The Wire, and that often gets in the way of pursuing murder cases. In the real world, they pay professionals. That's why we call them pros. And by not focusing on community programs, it's not exactly the picture the defund the police movement is trying to paint. But being a police isn't just about carrying a gun. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's about working with the community. The community? Y'all ain't been up in my community in a long time except the whale on people. The police in The Wire are still, by and large, catching bad guys. And the show often focuses on the most black and white cases, like murder. I'm not a narco. I don't dirty people because I don't give a shit about a possession charge. I'm a murder police. I'm here about the bodies. Little attention is paid to whether the laws themselves are fair. How the war on drugs escalated when crack and cocaine were classified in a way that targeted communities of color. But at the same time, it's hard to walk away from the wire feeling good about the current state of policing. Internal politics and personal vendettas often get in the way of real police work. The department has more than a few bad apples, and the department higher-ups are often cooking crime stats. How are you gonna give Rawls his numbers? I don't know, flex squads on the corners, foot patrols in the Perkins homes, overtime out the ash, and if that don't work, cheat on the stats. Still, this is better than a lot of cop shows because The Wire doesn't laugh at or excuse any of the behavior we see. The time The Wire takes with the characters on the street changes the audience's dynamic with both sides of the war on drugs. In the words of David Simon, quote, On shows where the arrest matters, the suspect exists to exalt the good guys, to make the Sipowitzes and the Pembletons and the Joe Fridays that much more moral, that much more righteous, that much more intellectualized. It's to validate their point of view and the point of view of society. So you end up with the same stilted picture of the underclass. Either they're salt of the earth looking for a break and not at all responsible, or they're venal and evil and need to be punished. As much as The Wire was being touted as must-watch TV depicting black voices in the wake of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, it's much more squarely aimed at poverty itself, something that absolutely affects communities of color disproportionately, but not exclusively. The second season of The Wire surprised a lot of people when it switched from the traditional war on drugs story with Avon Barksdale to a bunch of white Polish dock workers. And I don't know how to tell you this without hurting you deeply. First of all, you happen to be white. And that's actually what The Wire wants to point to, the larger institutions of capitalism and poverty that oppress everyone and are the upstream factors that lead to crime. In the words of ta Coates, Season two. He's like, oh, you thought this was some black shit? But to say, no, no, this ain't just black folks. This is the system at large and it's eating at everything. The Wire is using this story of police and crime in Baltimore to tell a larger systemic story that ranges far beyond the police. It might start at the police level, but as it tries to trace everything back, it reveals how much more systemic all of our problems are. For The Wire, focusing on the police is like trying to solve cancer with a band-aid. Hey, yo, banker, cash me out, yo. That's my money. Man, money ain't got no owners. Only spenders. If there's an antagonist of The Wire, it's not drug gangs or crooked cops. It's poverty and the unmitigated capitalism that creates it. Rush. Communist? I know, I know, I know. I didn't expect to end up here either, but I think we need to expand our horizons and accept that capitalism is a useful framework for looking at the police. On the show, capital interests are often below the surface, but they're there, constantly. Each institution The Wire investigates, the war on drugs, labor unions, city politics, the education system, and the media serve as gods over the characters of the show. As David Simon told The Fader in 2006, he modeled The Wire after Greek tragedies. Quote, But instead of Olympian gods that are throwing lightning bolts and f***ing people up for the fun of it, we have postmodern institutions. The police department is the god. The drug trade is the god. The school system is the god. The city hall is the god. The election is the god. Capitalism is the ultimate god in The Wire. Capitalism is Zeus. It's Baltimore, gentlemen. The gods will not save you. Whether it's police, education, or politics, everything bends the knee to capital. Our detectives are constantly trying to do good police work, only to be pressured from higher ups to produce small, immediate busts, abstractions separate from their mission of taking down Avon Barksdale. We are not gonna buy our way up the ladder here. These people do not touch the drugs. They don't go near the drugs. The wire is what gives us Barksdale. 
Our police are consistently asked to put numbers and statistics over the job at hand. Our unit clearance rate is under 50%. We do not go looking for bodies. We do not put red up on the board voluntarily. They're steered away from investigations because of economic interests. I'm just following the money. And we will follow it after the polls close. The drug trade itself is purely capitalist. There are no regulations. The game is simply ruled by supply and demand and exploits its community, feeding off its money and its life. Nah, it's just business. Prez is able to reach his kids by teaching them math on their terms, but is separated from his task when the school forces him to teach for a standardized test. The thing is, it's your curriculum and you have to stick to it. I can't, it's absurd. You have to. That test in April is the difference between the state taking over the school or not. I think so many of us think today of capitalist interests as villains, as corporations. But The Wire deals with them in more banal ways. There's no shadowy Murdoch family using its money and influence. There are no billionaires or Amazon or Facebook. Instead, we see how the system is a force unto itself. This game is rigged, man. We like the little bitches on the chessboard. Pawns. In their review of The Wire, Helena Sheehan and Seamus Sweeney had this to say, quote, commodity value is constantly prioritized over use value. The public sector has become impoverished to the point where it cannot meet basic needs, while money accumulates in other sectors, particularly in the drug trade, beyond any possible need or use. Meanwhile, politicians cut budgets and police and teachers cut corners on the job and go into debt at home. This is a dynamic that's become incredibly pronounced in 2020 with the economy recovering from the coronavirus in what's called a K-shaped recovery. Stock prices lining the pockets of the richest Americans have rebounded nicely, while indicators for the working class, like unemployment, remain high. The result is that the richest Americans have gotten richer during the economic recession. Billionaires have added $637 billion in wealth from March to June. And this is indicative of the larger wealth inequality gap that has been growing for decades. Since the 1980s, wage growth has stagnated while productivity has continued to climb. The bottom 50% of the American population controls just about 13% of its economic wealth, while the top 1% owns over 20%, all while mostly avoiding taxes. Meanwhile, numerous cities are projecting huge budget shortfalls. For example, $7.1 billion for New York City and $1.2 billion for Chicago. Those shortfalls will have real impacts on those most affected by hard times, all while the rich keep getting richer. The disregard capitalism pays to the needs of a community is most purely represented by the kingpin left standing at the end of the series, Marlo Stanfield. Oh, you like that? I had it for a long time now. It got some sentimental values. Just the thing. What's the real value? Huh? Real value. I ain't, I ain't much for sentiment. Marlo doesn't care about family, relationships, or really anything other than being on top. He is willing to do whatever it takes to get there. He's willing to lie, cheat, steal, kill, whatever it takes. We don't ever get the sense that there's any more to Marlo than pure capitalist ruthlessness gangsterism. Really, he's American in the pure sense. The mindless exploitation of unmitigated capitalism can be seen in the tragedy of Bodhi. Bodhi does everything a drug kingpin could ever ask for in a soldier. He follows orders, he's loyal, and he's smart. He's ruthless when he has to be, but he isn't bloodthirsty. In short, he plays the game the right way. I ain't never f***ed up account, never stole off a package, never did some sh that I wasn't told to do. But in the end, his crew is absorbed by Marlowe's organization, who shows no loyalty back to him. Bodhi realizes that even if he did everything right in his world, played the game the right way, and was a loyal soldier, he could still be chewed up and left to rot in one of the vacant houses. They want me to stand with them, right? Where the f*** are they at when they supposed to be standing by us? This kind of exploitation isn't unique to the drug trade. It's an aspect of capitalism. It's just that we've deemed the drug trade's capitalism illegitimate because its version of exploitation is so obvious. See, that's what I don't get about the drug trade. When everything else in this country gets sold without people shooting each other behind it. Everyone in the game is trying to find a way to make ends meet any way they can. Society might look down on Omar for killing people, for example, but we all have our place in the game. You are a parasite who leeches off Just like you, the culture man. of drugs. Excuse me? What? I got the shotgun. Got the briefcase. It's on the game, though, right? 
David Simon himself has been cagey on his stance on capitalism and Marxism. In an impromptu speech in Sydney in 2013, he called for a balance between capital and labor, denouncing America today as out of whack. Quote, that might be the ultimate tragedy of capitalism in our time, that it has achieved its dominance without regard to a social compact, without being connected to any other metric for human progress. Of course, there are counter arguments to this line of thinking that I'll probably butcher because I'm not an expert on any of these ideologies. I just watch television. Some capitalists might argue that Marxism is incapable of creating the overall wealth that allows people to be taken care of. And some Marxists would argue that capitalism cannot be kept in check due to its insatiable appetite. And Simon definitely seems to agree that without a strong limiting mechanism, capitalism will devour everything in sight. Quote, the last job of capitalism, having won all the battles against labor, having acquired the ultimate authority, almost the ultimate moral authority over what's a good idea or what's not, or what's valued and what's not, the last journey for capital in my country has been to buy the electoral process, the one venue for reform that remained to Americans. Okay, the Marxist reading of The Wire is fascinating and there is a ton of great writing on the subject, but we gotta bring this back to why we're here. Cops. It's very bad, granted, but isn't it actually symptomatic of a much greater dynamic? Like we want to rediscover a world that for too long has been ignored. Examine the tragedy underlying these murders, the neglect. The Dickensian aspect. I think at this point it should be fairly obvious that I'm a big fan of The Wire, and that the way it structures itself has influenced this series on Copaganda quite a bit. In basically every episode of the series you can find me complaining about how a show needs to include more context to crime and policing. In order to understand the police and the issues facing police reform, I think we have to understand the big picture the institution resides within, and that's what The Wire provides us. But I also think it's really important to grapple with what the value of that media is. I mentioned David Simon's opinions of Karl Marx in the previous section, but let me just add one more. I think Marx was a much better diagnostician than he was clinician. In some ways, I think you can characterize Simon himself and The Wire the same way. Every institution the show turns to as a remedy for society's problems proves to be part of the very same problem, from the police to city hall to unions to schools to the media itself. Dickensian is a word that was used in a bunch of reviews of The Wire from its time on the air to describe the way it detailed the social conditions impoverished communities face. And in its fifth and final season, The Wire gets self-aware. It follows a local newspaper and they use the word Dickensian a lot. The word I'm thinking about is Dickensian. Our coverage should reflect the uh, Dickensian aspect. The Dickensian aspect of it, yeah. Journalism, like any other institution The Wire presents, isn't going to make anything better. Part of that is because of the capitalist incentive structure to sell more newspapers. But part of it is that journalism's role is to report, not to provide any solutions. The closest the series gets to any kind of solution is in its third season, where Bunny Colvin, still a police officer at that time, legalizes the drug trade in a small section of West Baltimore. In the process, he cleans up the entire surrounding area, corralling the worst aspects of the game into one contained location. That place becomes known as Hamsterdam, a government-subsidized drug economy. The police even demand that dealers pay their grunts unemployment now that they're no longer needed. The rest of this, use it to pay them hoppers for the week. Whether you use them or not, you pay this money out. It's like unemployment insurance. But then the entire system falls apart once someone gets murdered and the Baltimore Police Department is forced to crack down. I think there's a certain attraction to a fatalistic reading of The Wire. The show makes a really compelling argument for the sheer overwhelming nature of the system. It's massive and resilient as all hell. What's more, that bleak perspective can become a bit of a signaling device for voyeur audiences. People whose only connection to this world is through television. In her excellent article about The Wire written in the wake of Freddie Gray's death and the following Baltimore riots, The Washington Post's Alyssa Rosenberg argued how that reading of The Wire makes viewers complacent. Quote, we want to believe we have deep sympathy for and understanding of people whose lives bear the marks of institutional racism, decades of criminal justice policy, hopelessly inadequate education systems, and a profound lack of legitimate economic opportunity. And then we like to feel like there's nothing we really can do. And so there's nothing we are required to do. To feel that our own sense of surrender is actually sophistication. <sighs> and look, I get it. The is overwhelming. 
and it can make you feel like you want to throw your hands up. There's always something when it comes to police reform. There are the unions, and civil forfeiture, and qualified immunity, and all the stuff that exists upstream of that, like redlining, racially targeted laws, and real and the real threat that a gun could be in anyone's pocket in America. And then there's all the stuff that exists upstream of that, like wealth inequality and how capitalism encourages exploitation. The more you read about this stuff, the more you feel like the pretentious dude telling all your friends that they're worried about the wrong thing and you know what the right thing to be worried about is because you're so much more educated. But the message I take from The Wire isn't that we should give up hope. In the final scene of the series, and this is not a spoiler, McNulty drives back towards Baltimore. He stops on the side of the road to look at his city, and we see a montage of the urban organism we've come to know and understand over 60 plus hours of television. He sees the crime, the corruption, the inequality, the mess, and then he gets in his car and he says, Let's go. You can read this as surrender, that McNulty is resigning himself to his trash pile, but I don't. I think he sees his home for all its ugliness, but also its potential and he chooses to head back into the fray. Reform and change is messy, and that's beyond just the police, but that's what makes The Wire so important. It's not a cop show, it's a show about systems and power and money. It shows us the context that surrounds the police, poverty, and crime, and how focusing on any one segment might not get the job done. Just like it's not useful to talk about bad apples when talking about the police as an institution, we can't just talk about the police when we wanna talk about crime. We have to look at the bigger picture, because you know what? All the pieces matter. Thank you so much for watching. I know this was a long one, but believe it or not, there's even more to talk about with cop shows. <laughs> From the way they represent mental health to spooky cop shows like Twin Peaks and True Detective. But the only way I can keep going with this series is if you engage with this video, and if you can, support the channel on Patreon. Patreon allows me to keep making these videos despite the whims of the almighty algorithm, and also gives you some pretty cool perks. You can get early access to my videos, extra TV reviews, my reading and watch lists, updates on the series, and Q&As. I'm really excited to keep doing this work, and I think it could be really important to the conversation the country is having, and if you agree, please consider swinging over there and helping out. These videos take a ton of time and effort, and I would love for this to be my full-time job. The link is in the description. The next episode in the series is going to be about the underrated and often overlooked classic, The Shield, one of the first anti-hero TV shows that focused on crooked cops in Los Angeles. It is simultaneously super anti-cop and also super pro-cop. It's gonna be a doozy. Thanks again. Talk to you guys next time. Or see you next time. I won't see any of you. I never see any of you. I will make another video and it will be there and you can watch it later and i will thank you then too thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you